If a child has a language difficulty, then the family should only speak to them in English at home. That answer is no, not necessarily. It's whatever language they can support their child in. And if you're teaching them one language at home, know that there will be language transfer that occurs, especially, you know, with that direct instruction given by an SLP, right? When we have metalinguistic awareness developing, and we're talking about the parts of speech and what's happening here with the morphology and the syntax, right? All of those um, elements get highlighted. Hello, and welcome to SLP Full Disclosure. I am your host, Jennifer Martin, and joining me today is Paula Acuna. And I am very, very excited about this episode because it's something that's near and dear to my heart. And I know that I'm going to learn many things that I didn't know, and I hope that you all will as well. So today we're going to be talking about bilingualism myths and parent coaching. And let me tell you a little bit about our guest before we get started. So Paula Acuna is an ASHA certified bilingual Spanish and English speech language pathologist and private practice owner, and she is based in the Chicagoland area. Her company, Miss Paula SLP, provides in-home, on-site, and teletherapy services and recent, recently launched Bilingual Speech Online, which is a parent-child coaching program for bilingual families that delivers online modules supplemented by live video consultations. Paula earned her master's from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and is an early intervention provider. She also serves as a clinical supervisor and is an ASHA STEP mentor. So welcome, Paula. We're so happy to have you. Thank you, Jennifer. It's a pleasure to be here. And I've been listening for, to this podcast for a while, so it's really a dream come true to be on. Oh, well, the feeling is mutual. <laughs> so <laughs> I say every time, I can't believe you, you know, everybody says yes, or not everybody, but many do. So because I, I just, I feel like one of the things that I love so much about our field is that it is so vast and we can't possibly know everything about everything. And so it's so cool that there are so many different areas that we can specialize in and the one that you specialize in is very near and dear to my heart as also being a bilingual uh, Spanish and English speaking SLP. Yes, we, we, we have to stick together. That's so right. <laughs> I, I heard um, we're unicorns in the field. So <laughs> Oh, well, I love that. And I do feel like it's so exciting also to see that the numbers are increasing of the number of bilingual SLPs. Yes, and finally. Even in <laughs> other languages. Yeah, besides, you know, Spanish, I just, it's such a cool shift. So, um, okay, before we get into the um, nitty gritty of this, I just would love to know, what is your professional journey? What led you down the road to becoming a speech language pathologist and uh, a bilingual one at that? Sure. So um, I was raised by Chilean immigrants, and we actually spoke English at home. So I learned Spanish mainly at school, um, even though both of my parents were native Spanish speakers. So um, I knew that I wanted to be bilingual. I wanted to work bilingually. And so uh, when I discovered the field of speech language pathology, I just made it my mission to go down that route. Um, now my graduate school program actually did not have a bilingual track, but I did find some clinical experiences that prepared me pretty well. And I had some phenomenal supervisors who were also very good mentors for me in that way. Um, and then once I graduated, I landed a CF in a school district that had a super solid dual language program. So over the years, I've worked with dual language learners in various settings, including schools, um, an equine assisted therapy center, and client homes. So in addition to um, you know my job, I've always had a side gig as an independent contractor, and that's how I became an early intervention provider during the pandemic, and uh, also decided to start my own practice. So. That's what got wow. me into it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you, it's really interesting. So a couple of things I'm just, um, want to follow up on. So I grew up in New Mexico about an hour from, um, 
the, from Mexico. And it was really interesting because a lot of my classmates were from families that spoke Spanish as their first language, mm -hmm. but they also were not spoken to in Spanish. It mm -hmm. was English only. And so as they went through school and got older, it was like, why? So um, I think that's really interesting. And, and what is the reasoning? Do you, or I'm sure you know by now why your parents chose English. Can you sure. tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'd love to. So I think um, my dad was really the one who decided, you know, we were going to focus on English. He had come to the U.S. in his late 20s. And he struggled to learn English, but he knew that really to succeed in the States, you had to be fluent. And so he had seen too many people who were still struggling to speak English, and he just didn't want me to live out that fate. Um, he wanted me to have the best opportunities. My parents also decide me, decided to put me into a Catholic school for K through 12. Um, and just given like the small size of that school, um, there was no bilingual programming there, so it wasn't an option. Now, of course, public schools and private schools alike have, you know, bilingual uh, programs and they really do support dual language learners. So it's very different now. And over the past 20 years, I think our country especially has just grown a lot in that way. So I'm curious, like when you were growing up, um, was it the families that decided they were going to speak English the same reasons my my parents did, or was it because of the schooling options? Yeah, it was exactly what you said, where mm -hmm. they, many of them had struggled to, you know, English is hard mm -hmm. <laughs> to learn. And so they had struggled and didn't want their kids to go through those same struggles. And so many of my my peers had grandparents that only spoke Spanish, didn't sure. speak any English, and they couldn't even really communicate well mm. with them. So same thing where, you know, when we know better, we do better. But at the time, the parents were making the decision that they felt was in the best interest of the child at that time. Exactly. But, you know, yeah. And do you feel like because of just being exposed to it, that you, it was easier for you to learn it when you decided you were really going to learn Spanish? I think um, I have a, a good ear for it. And I guess that helped me as a bilingual SLP and just working on my own accent, right? When I'm speaking Spanish, I feel like because I did learn and hear it at a younger age, it was easier to pick up on that. Um, now I'm, I'm still told that I speak like English is my first language, like a, a gringa accent, but I do think it was somewhat easier in that way. And I was able to practice speaking Spanish, you know, with my mom and my family. So I've traveled to Chile, I have dual citizenship, and I try to travel abroad whenever I can, especially to Spanish speaking countries. I love that. Yeah. And so now when you're with your family, what do you speak with them? Mostly English. Yeah. Okay. Unless I am visiting extended family in Chile. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So I'm able so to switch and, you know, FaceTime, I can do a Zoom call with my mom's cousin in Spanish, 100%. Yeah. So it's full circle. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like, you know, just from your upbringing and just what you're exposed to, or maybe wishing you were more exposed to, do you feel like that really was also part of the motivation for wanting to work with Spanish-speaking families and, and children? Yeah, I think um, a, a big part of my calling and what I think my mission is, is to share with parents and share just like the truth. So just like the purpose of this podcast is to dispel some myths. Um, I just want to be able to educate parents that are either unsure or struggling um, or just desire to to raise their kids to be bilingual. Uh, so mm. there's a lot of mixed messaging out there and I'm, I'm happy to, to clarify whenever I can. Yeah. So I am really looking forward to this as well, because what's interesting is, you know, you'd think, you know, still with it here in, I'm going to be 2023, I still work primarily with Spanish speaking families when I do direct therapy. And there still is that question that comes up all the time of we, what do we do if you know, we're speaking this and they go to school and they speak this, or if it's a family that does, that is bilingual there's still, I feel like a lot of misconceptions and just lack of knowledge about bilingualism. And um, so 
definitely we are going to get into these myths. So today we have seven myths and um, pretty common myths about bilingualism. So we are going to go through those and name them and have you help us to learn a little bit more so that when we do get asked these questions from families and just for our own personal knowledge, we're going to be better equipped. So um, you ready to get into it? I'm ready. Yep. And okay. <laughs> please don't shy away from supporting me if you know the answer too. So yeah, pull no, from it's your own experiences as well. Yeah, I will. But there are several that I was thinking, oh, I can't wait to, because <laughs> I really feel like I do need more information about that. So, okay. Myth number one is if a student has any learning challenges or is exceptional, they cannot learn more than one language. Okay. So just we know that there are so many children out there for whom their their home language right their l1 is different than that of the school language or l2 and the reality is they have to learn both right so in order to maintain their their family culture and heritage um, and to speak with like we said their parents their grandparents they will just need to and um you know it may be easier for some than others but we know that the acquisition of their second language will probably mirror that of their first. And, um, you know, language acquisition is, is a complex topic and there's a whole field devoted to second language acquisition and different theories out there. But um, a lot of the bilinguals in the U.S. now are learning two languages at once and uh, it's it's no problem for most, right? So when a child does have a language impairment, we know that it'll be difficult for them to learn either language or both languages. So one of the questions I, you know, it's off, it's, I've been asked this many times with, if I've been working with a child, for example, that has Down syndrome or an autistic child and the parents feel like they really don't know, like they are already going to struggle in some of these areas, especially language development being one of them. And so they wonder, should we only speak to them in one language? And then if they go to school, learn the second, or do you feel like if they do have those additional challenges that absolutely if to speak to them in either language or to start with one and then the other, what do you think about that? Yeah, we know that it's not inherently confusing to be exposed to two languages. So what I always tell families is, well, cause we know it's always case by case the advice that you give, but for families who do speak Spanish at home, for example, and they're more comfortable, right? They're more um, used to it. They have a better vocabulary. They have better grammar skills. I always encourage them to speak in their dominant language with their child and to try to foster that at home. Um, so, you know, by providing them with this richer input and more complex language, the child, no matter what, diagnosis they have will be just exposed to more quality language. Um, so we know that, like I said before, I think if you see that you're going to lose that home language, just so much deeper values and heritage and understanding and stories and humor, all of these things can get lost. Um, and so a lot of times I know that the schools are struggling because they don't have supports in place to support the home language. They may only have English language teachers, right? ESL, ELL programs. Um, and so I, I totally understand where the schools kind of have their hands tied and they're not able to get the staff that may speak the home language. So that can be challenging, yes. And it can also be challenging for these families if they're looking for outside support to find, say, like a Spanish speaking SLP um, to help them. So I know it can be challenging, but I think that my main advice is for parents to speak whatever language they are more comfortable using and they can dominate and they'll be able to support their child, you know, in the long haul. Yeah. And that's such a good point too, because if they don't have a strong understanding of the grammar and vocabulary of, for example, L2, mm -hmm. you know, we really want them to have that strong foundation in L1. And if they're going to be able to get that from the parents, because that's their stronger language, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah. And I also um, consider just like the values of the parents, right? So maybe they, they really are okay speaking English at home and they want to support their child and in any way possible and the school is only offering services in English right so then they're going to go full throttle on English but I kind of check in with them and make sure that they understand like okay well we're if you do want them to be bilingual it may be many many years from now and it may be harder than than it is now yeah and that's such a good point because if they don't get that L1 at home, it's oftentimes, you know, think about your particular situation. It's it's not impossible, but it's just more challenging to really have a good grasp of that later. So exactly. Um, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Okay. So myth number two, if a child has a language difficulty, then the family should only speak to them in English at home. Right. So we just addressed this. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that answer is no, not necessarily. It's whatever language they can support their child in. And if you're teaching them one language at home, know that there will be language transfer that occurs, especially, um, you know, with that direct instruction given by an SLP, right? When we have metalinguistic awareness developing and we're talking about the parts of speech and what's happening here with the morphology and the syntax, right? All of those um, elements get highlighted. So um, one of the things I do as a bilingual SLP is contrastive analysis. Um, It's also something that dual language teachers do. So they're looking at, you know, how is something in one language and the second language and how are they similar and how are they different? So tell me a little bit more about the contrastive analysis. I'm not aware of that. What? So tell, tell sure. me a little bit more about that. Um, it's just like, um, for example, when you look at how we use nouns and adjectives, right? In English, we say the brown bear, right? But in Spanish, you would say el oso pardo or oso marron. So it's the order in which it's noun and then down adjective, adjective, noun. So if you put that side to side, side by side, you can see, oh, in English, it's one way and in Spanish, it's another way. Okay. So it's more of really helping the child to see that side by mm-hmm. side mm-hmm. that to be able to say, oh, when I'm in this, using this language, it's going to be this when I'm using this and to, for them to start to understand those, correct the contrast between the two. Yep. And that, so that's gotcha. something that's taught in dual language classrooms, like mm. two way immersion programs, for example. Mm-hmm. But I think it's also something that good bilingual SLPs do, you know, week after week with their students, especially school age children. Yeah. And it makes perfect sense because even when we're teaching English in like an English class, Mm -hmm. you're going to understand the rules of why things are the way they are. So that makes perfect sense that why wouldn't you do that looking at each language Mm -hmm. because they do have different rules. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, Okay. Um, next myth, learning more than one language may be too confusing to children and lead to a language delay, decreased cognitive abilities or academic problems. So, um, one thing I think we have to recognize is that bilingualism and multilingualism is so normal across the world. It's just seen as something different here in the U S. So, um, you know, in the U.S., we don't, we haven't come to a point where we really value bilingualism. Um, And I think what that leads to is these lower expectations and worse outcomes. So uh, it's not true that a language, learning two languages would be confusing or lead to more problems. Um, Of course, for kids who do have language impairments or cognitive impairments, it will be challenging no doubt, but it's not the cause of those delays or deficits. Yeah. And I think that's such an important distinction of what you just said, because that is sometimes what I think, you know, even from parents I've spoken to where they think, well, if I don't, if I am using two, then it's going to cause them to speak later or have difficulties in both. And you're absolutely right. It's not the cause. I think it's easy to look at a child who may be learning more than one language that perhaps is taking a little bit longer because their brain is 
trying to learn two languages, mm-hmm. but that's not a cause or is is it a long-term delay? Is that right. accurate? Yep, that's right. And I think okay. I explain that a lot to parents and educators all the time, right? When we're looking mm-hmm. at bilingual evaluations, especially in the schools, like why, why am I here? Well, I explain like the school cannot just conduct this evaluation in English because they might find that your child has an impairment, but if your child's dominant language or preferred language or stronger language is Spanish, I need to make sure that this impairment also exists in Spanish because otherwise they're going to over-identify. So I kind of educate about what does that mean and, you know, how do we not under-identify but also not over-identify students. Yeah, and unfortunately, I mean, I still hear about that happening way too often where the student hasn't had a Spanish-speaking SLP and then does get one and they're like, they don't need, you know, they're doing so well. And so it is, it's one of those where, you know, that in itself is, is more of the travesty versus, you know, any sort of negative impact that could come from learning two languages. Sure. So well said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and in your opinion, just a quick follow up on that, um, do you feel like, you know, kind of the standard way of, of looking at the students and having the, you know, the assessment done in Spanish, assessment done in English, and being able to look at those two together. Do you feel like that's still a pretty accurate or the most accurate way in addition to possibly some informal measures that we can make sure that we're not overqualifying? So one thing we say is that a bilingual isn't just two monolinguals together, even though we'd like to think that, right? <laughs> they may at any point in time have stronger skills in one language than another. You know, bilingualism is a very dynamic process. So um, personally, I I don't like to divide and conquer and say, you know, one SLP is gonna do the English testing and another SLP is gonna do a Spanish testing and they're rarely gonna talk to each other about the child and then they're just gonna come together to write the report and present their findings. I think it's much better if you have one person who really does get in there. Um, What I do is I do parent interviews, teacher questionnaires, classroom observations, um, informal language sample, a conversation in both languages. Um, I try to get like a story retell. And then I also do some uh, formal assessment measures. So um, I much prefer it that way, you know, for me to look holistically at the student Um, and see, you know, and again, like we were talking about before, the family may be valuing and focusing on English, right? And Spanish is just spoken on the weekends with uncles, aunts, and grandparents, right? So like this, um, this idea that the child is like, you know, surrounded by Spanish maybe is, it's too much credit, right? in that. And sometimes the schools just don't know. So I have to find out from the parents. Yeah, that sounds, I mean, what you're doing is so thorough. I mean, that's incredible, but that is such a good point about, you know, I know I've had jobs in the past at school districts where I would just go around and do all the Spanish evaluations. Mm -hmm. Somebody else would do all the English and you're right. I mean, we miss, there's a lot of just subtleties and things that happen from being able to watch how they're processing in one language versus the other and really being able to tell, like, is it a difference versus they're just not getting this? So I love that idea of doing, you know, having one clinician do both assessments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it is hard. It's a lot of work. I think Yeah, people don't really understand the time that goes into it, but it is a a labor of love. (laughs) Yeah, but I mean, what that's doing is truly probably, you probably helped several students that did, were appropriate and did qualify for, and those that really didn't. Yeah, and so, for sure. you know, that that's, it, it's a lot of work in the front, but you saved a lot of time and energy in the back. Yes, that's true. We'll be right back to our interview. We just want to take a brief moment to shout out the company that makes this show possible, Med Travelers. 
If you are a therapist interested in traveling, visit medtravelers.com to explore the amazing benefits that Med Travelers has to offer. Featuring short and long-term contract opportunities at leading facilities across the country with higher earning potential, W-2 employee status, and a flexible schedule, Med Travelers is your advocate for career success. Visit medtravelers.com to begin your travel adventure today. And now back to the show. Okay, so myth four, Um, the older someone is, the harder it is to acquire a second language. Right. So I think that the truth here lies in speech sounds, right? And how we hear those differences and how we produce those differences, right? So that science shows us does get difficult with time. We are less able to hear the, the different phonemes. Um, and, you know, I've worked with several adults over the past couple of years on like rolling their R's and, you know, after not being able to roll their R's in Spanish for so long, it's, it's harder to learn. Um, but I think grammar rules are easier for older learners to grasp. So, um, like we were talking about contrastive analysis or looking at the syntax of a language all those linguistic transfer skills could be easier for an older adult when you have a first language that's well established, you know, that you're fully literate and verbal. So um, I think another thing that I can't stress enough is just somebody's motivation and attitude towards learning a new language, Um, the need to. So sometimes people are learning for work Um, or for travel, you know, maybe they're doing it um, because they're dating someone who speaks a different language. So there's all these different motivations and that might actually make it easier. Yeah, it definitely, I (laughs) I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, you have to want to do it. It's Mm -hmm. definitely not a, oh, I'm going to, you know, spend an hour once a week, it's really, it is a lot of work. So there is a big motivation factor. So I could see how that would be helpful as an adult, but that's really interesting what you said about the phonemes, because I had always thought, and I think a common misconception is that, oh, the plasticity of the brain, it's just harder to, to learn anything as you get older, to Mm -hmm. learn new things. Um, But the phony, that is really interesting because I hear often that people say, wow, you speak like a native for a lot of these sounds. And I think it Mm -hmm. is truly because I was exposed to those sounds of native Spanish speakers when you were younger. Yeah. Yeah. Growing up so close to the border, it was just, you know, I was, I was the minority in my classes. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, and that was just such a part of my upbringing was hearing Spanish all the time. And so that's really interesting. I hadn't, thought about it as far as the phoneme piece. I always thought it was just, Mm -hmm. well, your pathways are just (laughs) solidifying. So Mm -hmm. good luck learning anything, but you're you're saying there's hope. Yes. Yes, definitely. There is. And, um, we, we do know that I said the speech sounds are, um, easier to learn when you're younger, right? Mm -hmm. They, those speech sounds are more difficult as you age, but I think the grammar piece would be easier. We are older. Yeah. And another thing too, that is just really interesting is that the whole, you know, once you, and I'd be interested from your perspective. So it sounds like it's basically in L2, if you don't use it, once you have learned it, you do lose in some L2, of it. Is that correct? Um, so I think of when I think of language loss, I typically think of an L1 when you're looking at oh. a sequential learner. So okay. it, like if we're saying they learn Spanish at home, but then mm-hmm. they were told to only speak English, right? So they're ignoring the Spanish and it just fades away. So they're mm-hmm. losing or that's called language attrition. Um, but what are you asking about now? Um, if so you don't lose I'm, it, you lose. If you don't so use it, you lose I'm it. I'm thinking if, you know, is L2, you know, mm-hmm. Spanish is my L2. And so... At one point in my career, I was four days a week, all day, every day with families that only spoke Spanish. So it was, you know, where, you know, just is almost felt just as second nature Mm -hmm. as Mm -hmm. English. 
now that I'm not seeing that many Spanish speaking families and I'm doing way less, I do find that when I am with them, I have to think a little bit harder. It just yeah. doesn't, it's like, oh wait, yes, what was course. that word again? What was that? So yep, that's also true. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Yep. You do need so, uh, to keep, you know, keep um, being exposed to it, practice in, you know, getting the input mm -hmm. and the use, right? So yeah, practicing how you're speaking. Yeah, both. Whereas I feel like with my L1, let's say I lived in another country, mm -hmm. I can't imagine that I would ever forget English or words in English, or is that, is that right? Is, is that true? That's probably true. But as I was okay. saying, right, like if a child, let's say they learned Spanish at home mm -hmm. from birth to age four. Okay. And then the focus shifted and everyone in the house and everyone at school is speaking English. Mm -hmm. Well, their skills that we're developing in Spanish are going to diminish um, very quickly, and especially if it's not being supported. So gotcha. let's just say the same child by age eight, they may not be able to even speak Spanish anymore. Mm, so. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> See, I knew I was going to learn. I was like, oh, I knew I was going to learn a lot from you, and I already have. Okay. So, um, myth five um, once students can speak English, they are ready to learn and succeed in a mainstream classroom. Wow, I wish that were the case. <laughs> Children um, definitely know how to socialize and, you know, say a few things before they can really learn from that second language, right, for academics. So um, one thing that we talk about is BICS versus CALP, so basic interpersonal communication skills. These are skills that develop within one to three years of being bilingual uh, versus CALP, which is cognitive academic language proficiency, which can take three to seven years to develop. So that's really, um, you know, learning that vocabulary that's higher level, tier three vocab, um, learning from what we read, right? So like really understanding concepts that are presented perhaps in a second language. So if only it were that easy, but we can't assume that. So of course, that's why we have like access testing to make sure that kids are proficient in English if we're going to drop the EL services. Yeah. And I think that's, this is such an important reminder because I am thinking of several students that I worked with that had great social language mm. in English. And so it was very easy to assume that that carried over into academics, mm -hmm. but you're exactly right. They're so, I mean, just as I could sit and speak with somebody at a restaurant all day in Spanish about <laughs> just the weather and life. But if you wanted to talk to me about something very academic in Spanish, even as an adult, that would be challenging for me because that's right. A different register, a different, level. different yeah, yeah, vocabulary, exactly. Yeah. So I think it's just a good reminder that even you know, we can't assume mm -hmm. based on just having casual social interactions with a, a, right. a student. Right. So definitely, by no means, <laughs> uh, yeah. like a language screener, if, if they can just pass a, a conversation in the hallway or... Mm -hmm. You know what else this makes me think of too that I think is important to call out is that I think also this happens with some of the parents and families of these students because mm. they may show up to the meetings and have that a good grasp of the social aspects and you know some of the yeah so social language of english and yeah. then we jump into the iep sure. and we're using all these technical terms and this information that's that is a higher level mm -hmm. and so i think that's a good reminder too that we can't assume even an adult who's in you know got social skills social language in l2 that that's not going to be above right. their understanding Yep, absolutely. And I was yeah. just talking to another colleague about this the other day mm -hmm. about um, interpreters and how important they are and how sometimes we wish that, you know, we could have our own like powwow with the um, 
with the interpreter first, you know, like just chat about like what terms we're going to use and, and make sure that everything is communicated effectively. Um, because sometimes things get lost in translation and a lot of times I like to do my own part of the meeting, right? Because I can, but for so many SLPs, that's not possible. So anyway, in, interpreters are important and there's, there's not enough of them that are skilled. No, it's a, it's a, yeah, there's, I've been in many meetings where it's like the older sibling is the interpreter. It's mm -hmm. like, uh, the one um, Spanish speaking teacher in the whole school. Yes. Uh, that gets that pulled seen. into all the meetings. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what do you, how, what would be a way that you would suggest, let's say, you know, there isn't an interpreter and the parents might say, no, it's, I, it's okay. I understand English, but you do wonder if you don't want them to miss anything that's really important being mm -hmm. said. Is there a, a way that you address that or that you would recommend somebody address that? So one thing I do, especially if I can't be at the meeting, all right, that's coming up, like the evalu evaluation or eligibility meeting in a school is I'll call the parents and do a summary of my results mm. in Spanish. <laughs> but that only goes so far as to cover the speech language part. So I'll kind of be able to explain, right, right, what is my role? What did I look at? What did I find? And what are my recommendations? So, I mean, if everybody could do that, like <laughs> the, bilingual, the bilingual psych, um, the bilingual social worker, but you know, it's just, it's just too tough. Yeah. And I think there also can be that intimidation factor where you don't want to say, I don't understand mm -hmm. you know, as, as the parent during the I, meetings. You know, of course. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, okay. So we now know that, um, just because you can speak English does not mean that there may not be some other underlying things going on. So mm -hmm. to be mindful of that. Okay. Myth six. It is a sign of a child being lazy if they mix two languages together instead of just using them one at a time. All right. So there's two things I want to talk about with this one. I think that um, for individuals who are able to dominate two languages and go back and forth between the two, um, there's something called code switching, right? And this is common and normal. And it's actually used very skillfully by bilinguals. So it does depend on who your audience is, right? Who your conversation partners are. Um, but any skilled bilingual should be able to say, okay, you know, in this context with this person, I'm going to speak English with this person. I can speak Spanish, but given what I know about each of these people, I might be able to use, you know, vocabulary that may be more colloquial as I see fit, right? So in that sense, um, I would say it's the opposite of being lazy. It's being very um, nuanced and, and skilled in, in how we're using language. Um, that being said, for emergent bilinguals, right, someone who's learning a second language or two languages, they may have to rely on whatever language they have developed more fully, right? to to um, fill in those vocabulary gaps that may exist. So you may hear a child trying to speak in English, but every now and then they're throwing in a word in Spanish because they just can't think of or don't know the word in English, right? So again, it's not that they're being lazy or not trying. It may just be that they're not at that point. Yeah, and I think that's such a, I've always thought, well, they're just being resourceful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, Hey, I, I want to get my message across. And so I, I, but I have had that question before is, you know, sh it, and what's your opinion on this? So if a teacher or a parent says when they're doing that, should it be called to their attention? Should anything be said about it? Should you encourage them to try to find the word in mm -hmm one language what what's your thoughts on that sure so i think um this is called translanguaging and it's when we do acknowledge what's being said but we might offer the appropriate word if we know it right so if they're in the presence of a bilingual educator who totally understands what they're trying to say the teacher or paraprofessional or slp might be able to just rephrase that um, so that it is like a, a better model 
Does that make sense? Yeah. So maybe repeating back to them mm -hmm. what you know they've said, but using, filling in the words that they used another language for instead of right. all one language. So it's like recasting in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But shouldn't be such where don't do that. Only it should never be. Right. I don't think it's a negative. It should be posed negatively. Yeah. Just... Okay. Like understanding first, like recognizing like, oh, this is what you mm -hmm. want to say and then offering yeah. the way you would say it. Yeah. And is it ever appropriate to say, um, you know, if they have a word that they've switched because they know it, let's say, you know, everything was in English, they know the one word in Spanish, is it appropriate to then maybe work on that and say, oh, you know, you said this, do you, do you know what it is in um, English or if not, let's practice it. Do you, is that an appropriate way to handle it as well? I definitely do that in evaluations and in therapy. So mm -hmm. I don't know if it would make much sense just casually, but yeah, in a therapeutic setting. Yes. A therapeutic. Sure. Sorry. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Versus yeah. the person at the, in the store line. Yeah. It's like, no, no, no. Yes. <laughs> no, for sure. Like a student, for example, in a therapeutic setting. Yes, or... I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, then it just kind of solidifies that, mm -hmm. take the opportunity to learn. Exactly. Maybe easier. A teachable moment. moment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so um, myth seven, bilingual children will perfectly use and have equal knowledge of both languages. So this is false. Um, again, I think because every bilingual develops in a different way in a different point in their life, they may be more dominant in one language compared to the other, right? So it's an ever-evolving process. Um, and I think it's just so hard to say, like, perfect. Who's perfect anyway? Yeah. <laughs> so, and how do you measure that? Right. You know, where it's like, you this is your score in one versus the other. And yeah. even though if you can communicate well and have some of those academic skills in both, it is hard to judge which one is your your more perfect language. Right. And again, like yeah. bilinguals aren't just two monolinguals, you know, in one. So we also, as I said, can't use multilingual criteria, right? Like certain tests, right? Standardized tests may not be appropriate for everybody. And there are very few bilingual assessments out there. So Yes, you're absolutely right. And I think that is so important to that distinction that, you know, I think sometimes we think, oh, well, to be bilingual, you do have to be equal, equally as good in both languages. But you're right. That's rarely the case. Mm -hmm. um, I was at a restaurant recently and the server was, she, she spoke five languages. Wow. So I know uh, <laughs> she's from Europe and, mm -hmm. you know, had parents that both spoke different languages and then, you know, the country she was in and then just, you know, had all these really cool to have five languages, but I'm guessing that all five were not of the exact same level. Right. But yet she's still bilingual in five languages. So right. I think that is a really important distinction that you made. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So now we have debunked some myths and I want to ask a little bit about and, um, you know, chat some about what the work that you are doing with families and um, children online and just to, you know, get a little bit more information because I, not only, you know, for us to learn, but also you are available for SLPs and families and people that may want to learn more from you. And we'll put all that information in our show notes as well. But tell us a little bit about you know, when you are doing that work with parents as part of your private practice online, in person, who is the clientele? Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned, our practice does have in-person service delivery as well as teletherapy. So that's one thing. Um, we can work with bilingual um, patients and clients across the age gamut, um, you know, all ages, but specifically with bilingual speech online, our target demographic is parents and caregivers who are speaking both English and Spanish and raising their children to be bilingual. And the focus of this um, 
new product is for parents of kids ages one to three. So toddlers and early preschool age kids who are developing their language skills in both language. And we know that parents at this age uh, are very, very concerned about their development. And there's a lot of unknowns, especially if it's the parent's first child. They may not, you know, know what to expect. Um, or if it's even a second or third born child and they appear a little bit more delayed, they may be wondering why. And so that's where we come in and provide our support. So just to clarify, so they, the parents need to be able to, parents and caregivers need to have both languages or at least a good understanding of English. For is bilingual that... speech online? Mm hmm Yes. Uh, the content okay. is presented in English. Yeah. Okay. So the idea is that they are teaching their kids both Spanish okay. and English. Now, what if you have a family that speaks only English, but they want their child to be bilingual, even though they sure. may not be? Yeah. Like yeah. Piece... It's, it's totally fine for them as well. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Assuming they have, you know, like their high school Spanish or... Yeah. You know, they're currently doing Duolingo or something. Yeah. So at least some basic understanding. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Gotcha. And, and tell me a little bit about what do these services look like? What happens during a session? You know, I know they're probably different depending on, but just in general. Yeah, sure. So parents have access to online course modules. So you, they have an account, they log in. Um, they get the content at the beginning of the week, and that includes pre-recorded videos, handouts, online activities, as well as additional resources. And um, a lot of the activities um, we encourage the parent to do with the child. Um, some of the, the activities for a given week are to like record the dyad, right, completing some sort of interaction. And we offer um, a six-week program as well as a 12-week program. So our six-week program has two built-in live consultation sessions, and the 12-week has three online sessions. And so for those meetings, um, they're meeting with a bilingual SLP to talk through any specific concerns, to review the material, have questions answered, things of that nature. And I think that's what makes this program unique uh, compared to other online courses is that there is that live portion. Yeah. So it's kind of a nice hybrid. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. And so when the children, when the parents contact you and you start working with the children, do most of them already have a known language or artic or speech and language delay or issue? Or are you, are they oftentimes coming to you to say, can you identify it? We do feel like something's going on. Sure. Can you help us with that? Yeah, I would say most of the inquiries I get are that uncertainty piece. Um, they're like, either my pediatrician said something or I think something's not quite right. I suspect there's some delays. I'm wondering if there's a speech and language impairment here. Or I have parents who know there's something wrong, but they're looking for that bilingual lens. They want to know, you know, how to best support their child or they're waiting to find a bilingual SLP, or they've just had a really hard time trying to find somebody locally. And so now they're turning to the internet and they're finding me. So that's what I'm hoping to do, just serve more families, and reach a wider audience. Yeah, and is, would you say that the language delay is the most common? Language, yes. Language issue you're addressing is with that age group? Yeah, typically they're like, like late okay. talkers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now and, with the the children of the pandemic, it's it's even harder to distinguish like what's happening here. Are they just not being socialized? Mm -hmm. um, what kind of environment were they in for those two years? It's, it's yeah. tricky. Yeah, that, that does add another um, layer. Variable. For sure. yeah. yeah. Like, what was it? Um, and so do you have student ever... Uh, children that that you're working with that you feel like ah this isn't the most appropriate you know service model for them or do you feel like because so much of it is family focused that mm -hmm. it really can be tailored to most all children sure so maybe i should start by saying that 
just like as a practice, I offer mm -hmm. free consultation. So mm -hmm. people from across the country, even in other countries have reached out to me and I just give a half an hour of my time to kind of discern what's going on here. Sometimes people come to me with an evaluation. Sometimes they don't have one. Sometimes they're looking for a second opinion. So I kind of use that first call just to figure out what the situation is and then I'll give them my recommendation. So, you know, we talked about this specific program is not for everyone. Mm -hmm. It's not meant to replace speech therapy or that whole process. If anything, it's like a supplement to speech therapy. Um, so it's complimentary. Yeah. No, and I think that's great. And um, and so you do see, that was going to be one of my questions as well, is so they don't need to live in Illinois. You are available to see yep. in, yep, that's in other right. areas as well. Other states, okay. other countries. Yep. Yeah. That is so great because, you know, there aren't enough <laughs> Paulas. <laughs> so, and and I do think also one of the big value adds is it probably is just less intimidating and just feels more comfortable for these families when you do speak the same language and you are able mm -hmm. to really understand exactly just even from your own personal experience, you know, what they're going through and, you know, the, the process of learning both languages and, and being able to address a lot of those subtleties that arise from that. So I'm sure it just feels very comforting to these families as well. Yeah, I'm trying to meet them where they are, right? Because everyone's yeah. kind of in a different spot in their journey. And, mm -hmm. you know, trying to educate parents and empower them to feel like they have agency and that they're doing whatever they can for their child. So it's definitely yeah. case by case. And, and I think the reason I developed this course is because I know that there are parents who are just looking for what they can do, then they want to know more, learn more so that well, they I can love, help. Yeah. And that's, I think that's so critical because, you know, that is the, especially at that age, that's mm -hmm. who they're spending all their time with. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like not us, right? It's not their right. speech pathologist, but, <laughs> and then I think it's so critical as well. I mean, you're empowering them yeah. with a lot of great skills and knowledge before they enter the school system because for some of them they will go on to have an IEP and mm -hmm. need additional services and so you've given them that gift as well of of coming going in already with with knowledge that they wouldn't have had otherwise right and i'm hoping that you know part of our profession is about prevention so mm -hmm. by just giving the parents these tools and strategies up front when their children are young, right? They can prevent um, any other problems from from arising um, when yeah. it's possible. Um, but yeah, we do. I tell my parents all the time that parent coaching is really the most effective way mm -hmm. to see these changes in your child because bringing your child to an SLP for 45 minutes a week is not going to be as effective, right? You need to be practicing mm -hmm. and implementing these strategies daily multiple times a day. And, and these parents do spend the most time with their kids, parents and care caregivers. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And just knowing why they're doing some of the things they're doing is just, again, it's just that knowledge is power piece. Yeah. So, um, and so if somebody, one of our listeners knows of a family or they themselves want more information, how do you do this? And is there like the start of one class and then you know, six weeks later or 12 weeks later, there's the start of another one. How does, how does the timing work? Sure. So you can visit online.misspaulaslp.com to find out more information. Um, we're currently um, preparing for it to become available in January of 2023. So if you were to purchase it um, before then, um, you would just get it in January. But basically once January comes around, whoever buys the program whenever they do they will get the first week's content and then a week goes by and look at the next week's content and then a week goes by and look at the next week's content so it gives parents um, a lot of flexibility right i think as you mentioned um, parents are very busy and so this gives them the opportunity to watch it on their own time practice on their own time 
and revisit the content too. So once you buy the program, you have lifetime access. So you can rewatch it as, as much as you want. Um, and then at certain points, right, we prompt participants to schedule those one-on-one -on -one sessions. And there's also a Facebook group um, that I've created for like parents to, to talk with one another. And I can also chime in via that. That's awesome. I mean, just, I mean, I love that they can go back and revisit it because we all know mm -hmm. that <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You hear something once and it's for, stuck forever. I mean, right. I, you know, some things I'm working on hearing hundreds of times and it still hasn't stuck. So, um, and if an SLP wanted to do this course with just, if they were working with bilingual children, would this be appropriate for them or? Yeah, absolutely. I think I've learned a lot from, um, like Laura Mize, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or I love her. the Hannon Center. Yeah. So yeah, uh, it, it incorporates strategies that we've learned, you know, in grad school or that you can find in a formal mm -hmm. program like that. It kind of summarizes a few of those ideas. They may be called something different, but yeah, everything is, is grounded and based on research and, um, with the bilingual component kind of layered in and, and to make it, you know, more, um, accessible, accessible yeah. to, to the bilingual clients. Well, I love that. And we'll put all the information in the show notes as well as how to get more information and how to find that online, because it really is such a valuable resource and is from working with early intervention for so much of my career, it really is that early, the earlier, the better. And it just makes mm -hmm. such a big difference. And so I, I love that you're, you're doing this work. Thanks. Um, okay. So I always like to finish with just a couple of, I call my lightning round. They're just fun questions. So okay. <laughs> no prep is needed, <laughs> but just, it's just a fun way to end. And then, um, want to just wrap up with what's next for you professionally, but okay. So here's your first question. It's a, would you rather? which I, I do love a would you rather. Okay. <laughs> would you rather live at the beach or in a cabin in the woods? Oof. That's tough. I think at the beach. Okay. Yeah. Probably especially now as winter's coming. <laughs> it's right. like, it sounds amazing. Yes. Um, okay. Another would you rather. Okay. Would you rather be completely invisible for one day or be able to fly for one day? Easy. I would love to fly. I would love to fly and teleport <laughs> every day of my yes. life. <laughs> yes, I, I agree. Yeah. Okay. One last question. If you could only work with one specific age for the rest of your career, what would it be? Two-year-olds. Okay. You just meet right in the middle of that birth to three. Yes. Yeah. Two-year-olds are <laughs> remarkable. They are just amazing little humans. So. That that they are. <laughs> um, I laugh um, so much. I laugh so much. <laughs> yeah. It's often that, me and the parents, I think, commiserating. But <laughs> Yes. It's like, oh, back, you know, when it's okay to not have a filter and it's so yeah. endearing. <laughs> yep. So yeah. I, I feel like really young and really old, you can have no filter and it's like, oh, right. <laughs> but yeah. it's that middle part where they, you know, you're expected to have one. So, okay. And then just the last uh, thing, Paula, is what is next for you professionally? You've done so much. You've created this awesome program. What's next? So I think really focusing on this branch of my business, my company, um, stepping away personally from a little bit of the, the in-person service delivery and focusing on the online again to serve more families. So my practice is doing well. I'm recruiting SLPs to be part of that team, um, but really just branching out and, and reaching people in other places. That's my focus. Well, <laughs> I, I love that you've committed your self professionally, at least for this, in this period of time to this, because it's so important. And I love how your story is kind of full circle to lead you to this place. And thank you so much for joining us today. And, um, 
I, again, I feel like I just have a better understanding about some things that I feel like I've, I've wondered about for a long time. So thank you so much for joining us and, um, and sharing with us. Thank you, Jennifer. It's been, it's been awesome. And that wraps up this episode. Thank you for tuning into SLP Full Disclosure. For more information about this episode, check out the show notes on our website at medtravelers.com slash SLP Full Disclosure. And don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe so you never miss a guest. Are you interested in becoming a travel SLP? Visit medtravelers.com to learn more and explore the exciting opportunities we offer at top level facilities across the country. Also, a special thanks to Jonathan Carey for producing this episode and Aiden Dykes for the music and editing. And as always, this episode was powered by Med Travelers. See you next time.